Hello, everybody. I'm Hello, sorry. Fuckers. We're sorry in advance. Um, yeah, I'm so, talking about that fucking background that he has on him right now. Yeah. <laughs> um, welcome to Blue Minds Think Alike episode. I don't remember. Um, so due to some bit of technical difficulties, myself and our resident, um, Michael Myers enthusiast, Danny Madrigal, that is the wrong side. There we go. Nope. That way. Yes. I don't know what's happening anymore. Okay. I'm, my brain doesn't work right now, but yeah, my, myself and Danny will be taking over as the hosts for this episode. And yeah, we kind of did do a Halo episode um, however many weeks ago. We didn't do a Red versus Blue episode. We touched on Red versus Blue. We didn't do like a whole thing. But we did properly do it. So we're going to do that bit ago. I also just now got, um, saw you the notification on Discord saying you I cut off from you. <laughs> Thank you. Now, wait, I have, I have a question for you. Just like one very simple question. I have one very simple answer for you. Why are we here? I don't know whether to answer the question or to kick you out of this meeting right now. <laughs> but I mean, we, did, we don't really know. It is, it, is a great, it is a really big mystery. Is there really a God out there who has a... Oh, just some cosmic coincidence, um, or is it really a god, you know, watching all of us, playing for us and stuff? Shit, I got that line wrong. I'm sorry, everybody. I, I, I don't remember the line exactly. Yeah. Um, as I'm rewatching Red vs. Blue right now, I'm on season three at the moment. Nice. Yeah. <clears throat> they re released um, all the, the all the seasons, but like the first seasons are just one, like, yeah. feature. They've been, um, yeah. like, a little, a little bit ago. They like re- they basically re-uploaded every like each individual season to YouTube, but they mm-hmm. basically spliced all the episodes together into one giant video. Like yeah. for not not like the entire show, like all 13 seasons, whatever in one video. Each individual season is its own video. So, red versus blue. Um well, okay, what was your first exposure to, to red versus blue? My very first exposure, okay. I have a clarification question. Do you want the story of how I first started watching Red vs. Blue or the first time I can recall having heard of Red vs. Blue? Having heard of Red vs. Blue. Okay, I specifically remember both, both things. Mm-hmm. Um, it was either seventh or eighth grade in middle school. I can't remember which. Um, I specifically remember this. There, we were in the... Like, I w- I'm wanting to say we it was for class, but like the we were all like in the school library. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm wanting to say it was for class, but it might have been for some other reason. Um, can't fully remember. Um, and I remember a one of my classmates whose name I shall not divulge. Um, I still remember it, <laughs> but whose classmates shall not divulge? Um, he somehow i this mu- this must have been before like our school had implemented the like advanced like web filters and such that they had for a lot of, for like when I was in high school yeah um cuz somehow he got rbb to play on the on one of the library computers <laughs> i don't know how um but basically i i didn't even know like the name of the show i just um remember looking over and he was talking he was like sitting in the chair talking like kind of someone and i saw um and what i'm remembering is i remember a picture on like the screen of because like i i knew known about halo like even mm-hmm. though i'd never played at the time i still knew like oh hey this guy in this spit, particular style of armor he's from this game called halo you know mm-hmm. and i saw a guy in that style of armor in blue and another one in red standing in I've my brain is remembering it as like blood gulch if it were covered in grass, but it must have just been blood gulch at the time. Because this this was back in like 
Oh boy. 2010, 2011, maybe in 2009. It says seventh or eighth grade, right? Yeah. So, so they, they would have been like 2011, 2012. Yeah, they would have been during the. I can't remember the official name for the saga, but the six, seven, and eight. Yeah. We were very racing at the time, but it was definitely something from the Blood Gulch Chronicles that he was watching. And I don't even recall if the name Red versus Blue appeared. Um, but then um, and then, but like, and like I didn't really think about the time because like, oh hey, halo guys. And like years later, and I'm in this part I might be remembering wrong. Um, I was at my brother's. Okay, no, so hold on. Okay, then yeah, I definitely am remembering it wrong. Um, because I'm, I'm trying to think of the timeline. At some point between that moment and when I started watching it. Like the name Reference Blue popped up again. At some, I, I remember like it popping up again in my life, but like I never watched it. Mm-hmm. But then fast forward to, I want to say, like in fifth, 2015, 2016, the, it, it was in between them having released season 12. Like they had already finished season 12. But it was prior to them having started releasing season 13. Right. Um, I can't I remember exactly what the time frame was because it was a bit a while ago. Um, I specifically remember this. I was sitting in the living room at my um, dad's old house, not the one he's in now, but the old one. And we didn't have like the paid version of Amazon Prime. We had right. like the app that comes with like some free stuff to watch. And I'm like, okay, I'm really bored because none of the Xbox games I want to play right are like interesting, at least not at this very moment. I'm just yeah. kind of scrolling through the section looking for something to watch. And Red versus Blue season one popped up as free to watch. And I'm like, oh, I kind of remember that show. It's based off of Halo. Ah, what the hell? Why not? Started watching it. And I don't remember how long it took me, but Knowing me, it was probably I, f- I finished binging all 12 seasons by the time before season 13 started releasing. Nice. <laughs> and yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> nice, nice. Um, I, I'd say f- for for me, um, my exposure to Reverse Blue was when Halo ODST was coming out. And they did a promotional video for ODST where they were looking at, you know. Could the the fire team uh, mode that Halo ODST had, they're, they're looking through it and going, and seeing how they were like had to fight off hordes of Covenant shit. Mm-hmm. They went, nah, fuck that. <laughs> it's like we're never doing this. <laughs> you know, like this is awful. And it was, I remember it was Griff. Yeah, I believe it was Griff. It was Sarge and it was Simmons, and they were all looking at them. They were all like panicking. That's about right. Yeah, but uh, and then I, I started watching around second to last year of high school i i saw it on netflix my dad gave me my uh his netflix so i could watch daredevil Mm -hmm. but netflix at the time they also had stuff like video game high school on there they had you know red vs blue and a bunch of other like youtuber made content on there Mm -hmm. i wish they still keep it on there though but whatever um and i remember i just binged watched all of red vs blue in like i think a week so like seasons one through 13 on Netflix. God. I remember just like just being like, there's nothing that's ever going to, I'm never going to watch anything like this ever again. Holy shit. Yeah. Yeah. That was a, it was a good time. Yeah. I'm sure you've I, seen some of the behind the, the behind the scenes stuff from Reverse Blue, right? Like the first one. The first, you've seen some of the behind the scenes stuff from Reverse Blue, right? Some of it. There, there's a video where they were recording for season one. And it is so alternate funny. endings. No, 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 no. It was like when they were recording the the voiceover, and it was um, it was Jeff and um, fuck, what's the name? Do do the uh, characters. I can tell you the actors' names. What are the character names? 
Okay, it was Griff and Sims. Griff and Simmons. Gus. Um, yes, Jeff yeah, and Gus. Gri- Griff yes. is Jeff Ramsey. Simmons is Gus Sarola. Yeah, and they're and they're they're so fucking young too, and they're like going through the lines and, and whatnot. I'm just like, this is weird. <laughs> this is fucking weird. Yeah. But like little did they know that at the time that they were making something like pretty, pretty fucking big. They they actually released um because like it was the, the creation of Red versus Blue was kind of like how they created Rooster Teeth, the company that yeah. like makes it. They released like a do, um like a few years ago, Rooster Teeth, they released a documentary um about like the history of like the company and like where it started and like how it kind of evolved over the years. Yeah. And they actually um in the thing, they actually like I remember, I think I want to say it was I I know Bernie was there, and I wanna say Matt and maybe Matt Hollum, who Force of Sarge, who was the at the time the CEO of the company, and maybe Jeff Ramsey was also there, but like they went back, they actually physically traveled. Um, because it was at Bernie's house that they made it. And so obviously Bernie didn't live there anymore. Mm-hmm. But they actually traveled back to the place and like talked with the owners and said, Hey, we used to live here. This is who we are, we're doing this thing. And the owner let them walk in, like film in the home you know yeah. and you and you, we actually saw the room that um like they filmed it in like they literally showed the room um the size of the room i swear to god um what's a good in what's a good analogy i can make how, how big is the room small it's like the size of a no of like a typical college dorm what's the size yeah. of that room that they made it in yeah. I have a feeling I know what you want. It's going to be, I think we may have talked about this. What's your favorite season? Oh, my favorite season. I think it has to be the last season. Or season 13, I'm sorry. Yeah, season, yeah honestly, same here. Yeah. Um, I have to, have to clarify. That. Yeah, I have to clarify. <laughs> what? Respect, like, respectfully, I'm not, I'm not saying that other stuff was bad per se. It had its own merits. I just feel like it would have been best, like, had they ended they could keep the like the universe and the world alive, but like the story of the Reds and the Blues of Project Freelancer, mm-hmm. and even of Project Freelancer itself, and that with season thirteen, and then they did like, like they did like RVB Zero, yeah. which is a new group of people but has connections to the other stuff. Is that good? Because I heard some pretty negative things about it. I've watched it. Um, it's it's not. I don't know. I, I'm not gonna. At least not not this moment. Okay. <laughs> um, like make make that like you can make it within the same world if you want to, and like have where appropriate connections. Like, oh, this company also happens to be dealing with project finance or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. But um, what I was trying to say is, yeah, season thirteen is honestly probably my favorite. Um. Oh. Before I forget, fun fact. Um, in, see, in the second to last episode, um, I think it was called the beginning of the end mm-hmm. of season 13. You know how when... Actually, no, wait. No, it actually what it wasn't. It was actually in the last episode. It wasn't the last episode. Um, when when the Reds and, after the Reds and Blues have sent out the signal to the whole entire galaxy, and they're aboard the staff of Kara and try to get to the control room to shut off the mantis it mantis mantis eyes. Mm-hmm. Not sure what the plural of ma- version of it is, is of mantis. Um, and how they're talking to Phyllis after she she was recovered. You know. Yeah. You know how on the panel it shows like that weird, like weird eye blue eye looking thing, and a bunch of random letters and numbers just kind of flashing. Yeah, I think I believe so. Yeah, I don't know how I noticed this. I I don't I don't think it was on my first watch through, but at some point I know I like I was I had a glance at that and I'm like, hold on, that looked like a actual word for a moment there. <laughs> Is it ever changing? Um, and I like pause and i did the thing where you go on youtube and you pause it and then fast forward while it's paused and it goes ahead like one frame you know yeah and i did it frame by frame <clears throat> until the letter until the letter starts about words 
for like it, it's on a cycle where like there's like I think like five or ten or something like that different random combinations of letters and numbers that just cycle through. Um, but one of them it says the words "church dies in the end." Holy fucking shit! Yeah. It says the word shoot dies in the end. It well, it what and like it was literally the last episode. So it wasn't I'm not, don't want to say it was a spoiler because we A with the trailer kind of knew he was gonna die. And B, he died, he actually died like five minutes later. Oh, sick bastards, man. But yeah. Sick bastards. <laughs> uh that that reminds me of um by the way, just a quick disclaimer, spoilers for Dead Space. If you've never played Dead Space, play Dead never Space. Never played Dead Space. Get off this video, go play Dead Space. But Dead Space does no, this I, thing I've never played Dead Space, I'm saying. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. I'm sorry. For, right, for those who played Dead Space and are watching this fucking video, you know what I'm talking about. Um, I will take your word for it. Okay, I'll play Dead Space. Um, but, man, that, that's fucking sick. Oh, that is some sick twisted shit right there. Just yeah. to like spoil it before it ends to just be like, mm-hmm. oh yeah, church dies is in the end. <laughs> that is some morbid shit. Oh yeah. man, speaking of church, church is still my favorite character, honestly. My my favorite character, like like throughout the entire throughout the entire thing, I who I don't know who my favorite character would be. Really? Because, like, they, they're all so awesome. <laughs> yeah. But, like, I mean, they, they, they do a good job of making each character unique and lovable and or hateable in their own way. Yeah. <laughs> Felix. <laughs> if, okay, see, see, Felix is the perfect, one of the perfect examples of a character that he's evil, he's a piece of shit, but, like, you can't help but root for the guy because he's just kind of awesome. That's true. Um, honestly, I say, I say church because he very, I, I feel like he sort of embodies all the rage that's inside of me. Because you've heard me go on like unhinged rants before. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We won't talk about Doctor Strange here. Um, but uh, we um fucking, and we were like seeing Red vs Blue for the first time, and like this is when back when I was high school, and I would go on like a lot of unhinged rants about things. Mm-hmm. And I just see Church doing that as well. And I'm like, I found my person. Someone understands. Someone understands. There's a yeah. there's an episode in um season 14, right? Like the sort of anthology season. Um yeah. season 14, yeah. It's like a bunch of yeah. like yeah. Like just stories and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Um, and it got to where um where they were trying to watch reservoir dogs again, but someone burnt the projector. They trying to did they and did they try to base did they try to remake Reservoir Dogs? They tried. They tried to do. They tried to remake Reservoir Dogs. And I remember specifically was that there's a line that Church says where he goes, "Guys, if I had to listen to, I forgot what the song's name was in in Reservoir Dogs. If I had to listen to Con in the Middle with you again for the hundredth time, I'm gonna pour gasoline over all over my body and end it all." And I was like, "Man, I relate to you so much." Um. I also want. I also want to say, well, on topic of season fourteen, one of the kind of thing times that they did for season fourteen was they had a death battle between Carolina and the Meta. That was a good. Time. I have a. I have a grieve. I have a grievance with that. With, with how with how they handled it. Mm-hmm. So th- so the way they did it is like they basically did a death battle of who would win with Carolina. Um, specifically Carolina, even though technically for like about two hours in this in the show well like two two hours in show like it was only like two seconds that we saw she had both ada and iota the ai yeah but they they played it out as if she had had epsilon right and then they played just the straight meta oh my god um i'll have to rewatch it again because i can't remember if they did the meta with the ai or without because because like both versions of it, he still has all the armor enhancements. It's right. just, it's almost impossible for them to run them without the AI. 
because otherwise he needs crap to have power to his suit to do it all. Right. But um, what I was trying to say was, like, they kind of start people evenly matched, but in the end, Carolina is able to, is able to beat the meta. Which, I mean, it, it makes sense, but it has been shown um, in, I believe, season six um, that the meta has Wyoming's temporal, like, manipulation enhancement. Yeah. And to the point where he can basically stop time for everyone but himself for theoretically as long as he wants. We, we never really see like a limit of how long can you do it for being reached. Um, so, th- so theoretically the meta could just stop time, walk up to Carolina, snap her neck and then end time. She dies. So, Jesus. We have to, so we have to assume he either doesn't have that enhancement or he can't run that enhancement. Probably. Yeah. Um, that's funny. You know what I always thought about when it came to Red vs. Blue, specifically Church and Tex? That relationship is toxic as fuck. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, Holy yeah. Shit, oh, dude. Bo- oh, boy. Oh, God. They're both awful for each other. Yeah. God damn. Well, uh, it could- well, actually, that's actually a good topic because one, one of my favorite moments, I don't know if it's my absolute favorite moment, but it's definitely like up there. Um, and on the same topic of like church and sex, because in season, well, actually, no, it's revealed in season eight that um, I, I think it was season eight, it might have been seven. No, no, no. Because it was nine and ten, where nine and during season nine, church was trapped inside the memory unit. Um, and that was when when he was inside the memory unit, they did the multiplayer from Halo Reach. Yeah, yeah, that was yeah. Really and then at the end of season nine, he gets brought out, um, by the Reds Blues and the not deceased Carolina. Yeah, who apparently was deceased, which. That's actually r- remind me after I'm done with this part. Remind me, I have to, I need to also say a thing about Carolina. Cool, I'm gonna write this down. <laughs> Please do, because I can't. Um, what I was saying so was that, that, whole, that whole memory thing was just sad. Like, yeah. goddamn. Um, like it's revealed that. Well, no, it, it's revealed in season eight, I believe. But it's like properly explored in nine and ten that um text what tech like text like freelancer text is actually an ai um based off of leonard church's deceased wife named um her name was allison yeah and when the alpha was created because the alpha hit the alpha was based off of the director and what, during the process that created the alpha, a by, text was also created as a byproduct of the process. Mm-hmm. Um, and like it, they go in the whole thing into this about how because the only th- because the only thing that the director could ever remember about her was the fact that she had failed it. She had failed. It meant that because that's all he remembered about her, it meant that no matter what task she set out to do, the freelancer text. Mm-hmm. AI was always going to end in failure no matter what because it's what she's based on yeah um, I can't remember why I started that line of thinking but I'm going to go with it <laughs> that's fine um, um, oh, uh, I remember. Um, and then like do that in season not in season 8 yeah, and then season nine is the whole like kind of flashbacks between when the the time just before the freelancers kind of broke apart, yeah. and when and church in the thing, and then season ten is them finding the trying to find the director, while also continuing the same flashback story from the previous season. Yeah, in the last, I want to say it was the last was either the last episode of season ten or the second to last episode. Um. 
it literally begins with a shot. Of, it literally begins with a shot of um, the director sitting in the bunker with the only light. There's like a few screens, and it's and it says the words "beginning playback," and it has like the the so the music is so sad, especially if like you know the whole story of everything. Yeah. Because like they kind of they didn't really explore it too much because what the Bloodwatch Chronicles <clears throat> was kind of just a fuck fuckering around, you know, messing with stuff. And as like any part of the day, they're like, oh, this isn't just gonna be like a six episode series. We're gonna actually make a thing out of this. They yeah. kind of start to add a bit of lore. Um, and if you watch it, and if you watch it back, some of the stuff that happens in later seasons is like referenced in seasons before, kind of like why how Church never reacted to when Omega possessed him. Um, as well as like a few other stuff I can't remember right now. But it wasn't until season six that we kind of really start to delve into Project Freelancer and the director and all that. Right. Um, and the entire time the director is made to look out to made out to be kind of like this ruthless asshole sort of type of thing mm-hmm. where he like pushes everyone to achieve the best possible thing they can, which is a good thing, but he does it in a way that is just so terrible, you know? Yeah. He seems to have like no compassion, no love really. Um, and, and then when, but then you realize in season 10, when you meet him in the present day, that that was just basically his way of showing grief because I guess, think about this now. I want to know like what was going through the director's head because this is, this is what he literally has. It's, reve- it's revealed at season 10 um, that Carolina is the daughter of Allison and the director. Mm-hmm. I, I can't remember going through the director's head because like, through Project Freelancer, an AI that is based off of the memory of failure that his deceased wife has competing pretty much to the death is what, is what almost seems like a lot of times against his blood daughter. <laughs> the show is fucked, man. It, it's, if you look at it like it's presented as a comedic show in a lot of elements. But if you look at it deep, it's really, it's, it gets deep. Well, well, that's kind of the, that's kind of the best thing about it. Uh, uh, have you seen the Jojo Rabbit yet? I have not. Okay. Um, fuck me. All yeah. right. Just to kind of, I, I think the fact that it's a comedy allows it for, for it to have such dark moments because comedy is drama, but heightened. They're like yeah. over exaggerated. It is just shitty situations but played up to the nth degree right yeah a lot of great comedies are able to play with that while also having some like really really fucking dark moments so like for um for example and i'm gonna be delving into something else entirely but bear with me because i'm gonna type back to red was blue but you know how like vox machina is extremely comedic the Legend of Vox Machina, yes. The Legend of Vox Machina, yeah, but like there are some like really, really fucked moments in that show. Like, oh yeah, the oh, Sun yeah. Tree and just Percy as a whole like character just oh, going I'm, nuts. Oh, I'm aware. I'm aware. <laughs> I'm, uh, you're aware. But like the reason why like those dark moments are so heightened is because the show is comedic in tone. Like you got fucking Scanlan talking about how he wants to smash everybody. You got Grog who literally wants to smash things. You got the, you know, the twins who are like bickering with each other. And, you know, Keyleth is like the innocent one and yeah. Pike, well, Pike's doing Pike things, but you see just all this gruesome shit happen. And it's, it's heightened because it's comedic in tone. Now with Red versus Blue, the fact that it's, it starts off as a, it's a sitcom, really. Yeah. It's about idiot soldiers who are put in blood golds, right? This little... This little piece of land where mm-hmm. they're tricked into thinking that the Reds and the Blues have to fight each other, even though it turns out that it's a lie by the time we get to season two. 
and they're just we're just following their lives as they're bullshitting their way through this war you know Mm -hmm. but the thing is is that with war comes like comes darkness right there comes like the loss Mm -hmm. of human life and i think they're able to elevate that darkness because it's a comedy you know it's not just because it's a comedy well it is but it's not limited to just it being a comedy it's it's like a well-rounded show altogether it's because like they add actual depth to the characters where like if they were just if they were to only in every scene he's in every moment he's mentioned portray griff as a lazy um glutton for food portray yeah. tucker as effectively scaling one and bang everyone sarge gruff either church is an asshole you know caboose is dumb they would t- like the one word that would come to mind when you think of a character they would to only describe him or portray him as that word mm-hmm. it would not even be close to the same show oh no no because yeah church is an asshole pretty much all the time but there's also the moments where he makes jokes, where he actually does something nice for people, where yeah. the moments in um, season 12, um, when he and Tucker have that like heart to heart after they both realize they kind of have been assholes to each other throughout the whole chorus thing. Yeah. Like that moment where like it shows that these are not just one faced characters. They are fully rounded characters. Mm-hmm. And because of that, because of the comedic elements, like you're saying, the dark moments, the like serious heartfelt moments, it allows us to get that much more immersed in this whole vibrant story. Yeah. Because we like we already liked them at, uh, from, yeah. from the beginning. They're they're written as likable characters. Yeah. And since they start off with that, they're able to dive deeper into who or what these characters are. Yeah. Like church was the most unexpected for me because he gets fucking blown up by a tank in the first season. And you're like, oh shit, he's gone, like immediately. And then he comes back as a ghost and then he possesses the body of a robot and then a lot of other fucking weird shit happens. And then like, oh yeah, no, he wasn't a ghost. Yeah, it turns out he's an AI. Continue. Yeah. yeah and then um, it just goes into this fucked yeah. like, world of like the freelancer project and how like the director was awful to them and then you you just you get the backstory of like tex and church in carolina as well yeah i'm rambling on it's not fresh in my mind like i want it to be i still need i'm still re-watching the show but from what i remember from the project freelancer arc fuck dude yeah like i, f- I feel like one of the reasons why like why like Revis was awesome is because like there's a lot of stuff that happens in the Blood Gulch Chronicles it's five seasons where they go to various different places and do like all different manner, just pretty much all the bullshit yeah um but what the end like pretty much except for kind of the chorus trilogy um because the chorus trilogy kind of was able to be its own thing but, like seasons six through ten were able to take bits of the blood gosh colors that seemed to be like nothing and make something incredible out of it like um mm. whether or not they had planned it at the time the fact where like i said before when omega possessed church and nothing happens um the whole thing of how i, I can't remember exactly how far it got revealed in blood gosh chronicles but when um vic was talking to tucker thinking that he was talking to a member of the red team. And then Tucker started getting this whole conspiracy about reds and blues are the same. It's all like all a lie, you know? Yeah. Um, and things like that. Um, the, the whole thing of church being stationed on sideline, you know, the whole, that's actually an interesting story. Um, the whole story of church being stationed on sidewinder. Yeah. Um, Cause it actually, I don't think they explicitly say that this is the order of events, but if you think about it, this is what makes sense. Because they actually seem to suggest you went to Blood Gulch first, but like after the end of, in the end of season 10, when it shows like Project Freelancer basically splits apart because of the meta and some of the people starting to rebel, 
the, it, the ending implied that Church is sent straight from there to Blood Gulch, but we know that's not true because he, he was at Sidewinder before he was at Blood Gulch. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, they, he would have had to go to Sidewinder and then for whatever reason, Tex was there because th- that t- the text that was at Sidewinder that, that basically killed his squad was an AI. It was the AI text. Yeah. And then he got probably, I think he got transferred to Blood Gulch from there. Well, actually, no. You see, I'm confused about this because at the in season 10, like when they're discussing um of like where to send the alpha and everything, um, Agent Florida, one of the um he he who he looks just like I believe the alpha is just kind of like a normal marine. Mm-hmm. Almost. Um it turns out that flower, you know, flowers. I think I think so, yeah. He was the um, leader of the blue team, but then died prior oh, to the start of the right. show. Yeah. And then Church kind of became the de facto leader. They yeah, revealed yeah. in season 10, because like, I, I believe they started talking about flowers in season one. In season 10, they revealed that he was actually a freelancer the whole time. But was basically like, for lack of a better term, forcibly retired. And it's like, hey, we need someone we trust to basically guard the alpha. Yeah, yeah. fuck, yeah. I'm, fuck, dude. I think I remember that. Yeah. Uh, honestly, from like, from the, when Halo 3 came out and onward, to me, it was just peak red versus blue. Yeah. Because like, they were able to do so much, especially when like, Monty when, when they actually got like, they were able to do actual animations with it. Yeah, when 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 Monty came into play, it was like, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna, we're gonna do some fuck shit with mm-hmm. this, right? It was insane because it, it was this small group of people making a Halo machinima, and mm-hmm. you're like, you know, you're thinking, oh, you know, this is gonna be fun and games, you know, we're seeing this theme play out through, the, you know, through gameplay, and then you see that little animation of like the warthog going through the walls. Yeah, I that's the first time that that happened. You're just like, holy shit! And then from then on out, it just that was just the trajectory of where Rooster Teeth. Holy shit! Something dropped. Sorry. Um, where like Rooster Teeth was gonna go from then on, from then on because then they made Ruby. Yeah. Know, shortly after this, and then they made um, Genlock. I believe is what it was Gen- called. It's technically. Pen- no, it is pronounced Genlock. Genlock. Yeah, the one with the yeah. the, the the you know the robot, yeah. the giant robot. Yeah. The giant robot mech anime starring Michael B. Jordan. <laughs> yep, starring um. Starring Apollo Creed's son. <laughs> yes. Um, God, that is that was, Creed was such a good yeah. movie. We're gonna have to talk about Creed some other time. Um, but yeah, it, it's just it's insane to me how how good this show is. Yeah. But to me, where it peaked the most was that fucking background behind you. Ain't so I'm gonna thing. get into this. I'm gonna get into this. This is my favorite scene for many reasons, right? And the reason being is because of the fact that it just ends. You don't know what happens after, you know, unless you're still falling out, you know, in the later seasons. Yeah. But for the longest time, you didn't know what happened. You're basically yeah. being told this story through the perspective of church. Yeah. Forward. And uh, let me pull up the line because I don't want to get this wrong. Which line? You know which line I'm talking about. The final line? The final line. Ain't that a bitch? That's that's, that's literally oh, his true. last hold line. On, on. Ain't that a bitch? Yeah, hold on, no, no I'm, I know that, but there's something before that. Um, Don't. Um, but the, okay. hold, hold on, hold on. There's so many stories where some great hero decides to give their life to save the day, and because of their sacrifice, the good guys win, the survivors all cheer, and everyone lives happily ever after. But the hero never gets to see that, that ending. That ending. They'll never know if their sacrifice actually made a difference. They'll never know if the day was truly saved. In the end, you just have to have faith. faith. Ain't that Ain't a bitch? That a bitch. <laughs> Fuck me, that is some. I have watched that writing so many times. But it's true. It's fucking true because like you see all these movies where like the hero sacrifices himself. But they never truly really know. But they don't know. And the fact that they ended it there, it's like yeah. 
Y'all ain't going to know either for a while. You're gonna, we're going to put you in church's shoes. It's just peak yeah. writing to me because, mm-hmm. and, and this is why I think that this is the definitive ending for the show. Like it should just end here. Like I'm sure that the other seasons are fun in their own right, but right here is where it's like, yeah, this is yeah. where it peaked and this is where it should have stopped mm-hmm. for me at least. Yeah. Because we followed this guy through Blood Gulch, through like the freelance ser- uh, arc, through yeah. everything. We've seen what this guy goes through and, you know, for him to find out that this whole time he's just been a fucking AI the whole time, you yeah. know? And to see him sort of like put all his little bickering and personality traits aside and go, this is the only way to fucking do it. And, and I, I'm, I'm not going to make it out of this. Yeah. See him like for, for the first time, really be like a true hero. Mm-hmm. Like not to say that he hasn't had heroic moments. I know. But here is where he was like, yeah, no, this, is, this solidified him as a hero. <laughs> It just it just speaks a lot to the to the writing team at the time who who were doing this show. I have and a, I have a theory that, that and like there's no and I doubt there's there's any way this will ever be confirmed, um, confirmed or denied or anything. But I have because like the whole thing with the meta was that he wanted to be human. Mm-hmm. Um, like like I get a sense that the meta kind of wants to just collect every AI fragment and basically reform it almost and be like and be like a human you know yeah um and the whole idea of it being meta stability which from what, if i understand what I, they were using as which was that whole process of um like forming the ais together i, I have a feeling that church achieved, was able to achieve meta stability yeah because like he, he literally talks about how he started as a fragment of someone else's memories, but then he became his own person, which I fully believe. Like Epsilon and the like. So Alpha and Epsilon are two very different things, even though they're effectively the same guy almost, but also different. But if you think about like Epsilon and the director, at least Epsilon by the end of it extremely different you know the thing about with carolina yes carolina yes um they never really explained it at least not in a way that i thought was proper in like the main show Mm -hmm. um but in i want to say It was either 16 or 17, because season 13 was where the main thing ended. 14 was like the little short story collection thing. 15, um, wait, no, hold on. I'm, I'm trying to think of how the stuff went. Okay. If I, I'm trying to think of the plot points, but like if I'm remembering this correctly, like season 15 was that was with Temple and the and another group of Reds and Blues who are trying to basically destroy time. Yeah, I think that and was then, season. And like it was interesting how they made it its own season, but also made it not its own season in a weird way. <laughs> um, but like, but then at when the whole time she was going out, Donut got zapped. And basically yeah. became a, temp- a, t- a temporal anomaly. And then season 16 um, dealt with like stuff, if I'm remembering this correct, the all of this stuff correctly, season 16 dealt with like stuff like that while they were, um, while they were basically, and I remember it ended with them kind of going back in time to prevent Wash from getting injured. Because in season 15, he got shot through the neck and got got permanent brain damage caused to him. That's right, yeah. Yeah, and it was, like, in episode 60, I believe, it was them going back to time to try to prevent that. They succeeded, but it was realized that because of that, because of them, of, of them never having to stop to take care of Wash, 
they would have stopped tempo before he activated the time machine, which would have caused a paradox. And they Ooh. caused the paradox, which basically halfway broke the universe. And then, if I'm remembering correctly, season 17, um, was because, sorry, if, I, if I'm remembering correctly, because like the way it, it worked was, there was that weird like God entity um, that Donut, I believe, was trying to destroy. He succeeded, but he succeeded like a fraction of a second after the paradox was created. And because of that, like the entity was trapped in that weird cage that was slowly starting to break as more and more timelines were fractured from this paradox. Right. And it was the whole thing of them trying to go back and like commit to I, I'm getting to I'm getting to the Carolina thing here. Don't worry, I'm gonna connect this all. And it basically starts with Donut having to basically hop through time, collect the reds and blues, and make them like, because he's referred to as a Shizno, which I believe is basically like whatever sort of time anomaly Donut was at the time was called a Shizno. Basically right. having around time, finding all the other reds and blues, making them Shiznos as well, by like creating his own paradoxes for them. Cause, okay. cause, I, cause I, no, cause I remember um, like the whole, the whole thing was like making someone know information that like doesn't exist or having them know something and not know something at the same time, mm -hmm. which would then break time in the same way that Donut had done so. Like I remember that, um, I believe he went to Washington, who had basically developed two personalities, one of which was an eccentric billionaire, and the other was brain-damaged Washington. <laughs> oh, God. Um, and basically forced both of them to realize that the other existed, which made Washington just know. They, and then this is where Caroline comes in. They, went, they basically went back in time to before Blood Gulch, but after Project, after Project Freelancer broke apart. And this is where we got the story of where Carolina had been prior to her appearing in season 10. Right. Which was, so like apparently after the meta had dropped her off that cliff on the whatever snowy planet they were on, she survived the fall and then basically went to hiding as some random UNSC enlistee. Mm -hmm. Um... And then it was basically Washington and Donut going to find her, making her a shizno. But like the whole thing of Carolina never having been like, what, like how did she get from being thrown off the cliff by the meta to suddenly she's now with the reds and blues? Where was the time gap? That was never explained in seasons one through 13. It was explained until season 17, I believe it was. But we go cosmic hardcore. <laughs> we go real cosmic hardcore, which like I, I love the way they did it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I might I might check out the later seasons because I I only watched season fifteen and then I kind of stopped after that. Yeah. I remember, really, I I just I I really like the ending to thirteen a lot. I do. And it's not to say that like the later seasons ruin that ending, but I just like the idea of not knowing what happens after. You know. Yeah. It, there's something poetic about it, in my opinion. Can, there can, it is. There's the pretentiousness coming out. Can we also say, how, well, like, especially with some of the stuff in the Blood Gosh Chronicles, how contradictory it is to itself? Yeah. Because not, like, I'll, I'll accept that literally no one died when Andy the bomb blew up the Pelican at the end of season five. I'll accept that. Um, but like one of the things is how it the show claims that the whole in season, I want to see if it's like season two or three, the whole time travel thing on Sidewinder with like 15 million churches. Oh my god. Remember? Like, like the because like the bomb basically the bomb, because it was in front of church, like it was on the church's front of his body, sent everyone else forward and sent church back. <laughs> I love the logic they use with that. Um 
but how but then like late in the show it basically said it wasn't time travel it was like we are some weird fuckery if that was so how did um i thought so then a how did all those churches other churches get there yeah and b um an- another thing that it's not really explained at the moment but we figure it out later in i forgot which season it is. it's in one of the seasons where they moved on to halo 2 multiplayer for making it when they go basically into Caboose's mind. Okay. Um, and, and, and at some point, um, Caboose's memory of sister is killed. And, well, it, it's either killed or... No, I think, because I think if you basically, it kind of briefly fuck with this a bit, but if you kill Caboose's memory of someone, then he basically just acts as if he's never seen them before. Yeah. I, th- I think somehow, like, the Caboose's memory of sister got forced to be ejected from his mind. And then we see a brief snippet of a yellow armor charge popping up on Sidewinder in the in Halo Combat Evolved style. God. So they lied. <laughs> that the, the A wasn't even a church, apparently. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Motherfuckers. God damn. But I also love how the way they do it in season in the season two, which is just like they look at all these identical churches, it's like weird blue, and they look at the one guy who's in yellow armor. Don't ask. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, what the fuck? How does your armor change color? Okay. But yeah, I think we should probably wrap it up here then. We should. Um, yeah. Um better- Thank you, everyone, for watching. We are so sorry. <laughs> um, next time, I don't know if there's ever going to be a nice time. Next okay. time, I, I would promise that next time we will do better, but we all know it would be a lie. Yes. Anyway, yeah. bye-bye. Take it easy, you fuckheads. <laughs> of course.